Good morning, and uh, thank you very much for this kind invitation. Um, I think I'm going to find this a more challenging community than I normally talk to, which is teachers and policy makers and education leaders. But this is a group of people who are working every day with learning design and with supporting, I'm going to get closer, so not too close, um, supporting academics in understanding how best to deal with educational technology in all its forms. So I'm very grateful for this invitation and look forward to discussing this kind of approach. Right? Okay. So, um, it's not moving on with these. I don't think it's actually moving on. This is not moving anything. Maybe it lost focus? Now it's okay? Is it moving? Yeah. Yes, now it's moving. Yeah. Okay, great. Okay, thank you. Um, so the, um, the outline of the talk then is to address these three principal questions. What do students need from educational technology? and unquestionably it's more support for active and social learning. Who's going to develop these new digital pedagogies? And my main focus really is trusting the teachers to do it, not to ask the ed tech companies to do it for us, but to bring teachers right into the center of designing how we best use these kinds of technologies. So what do they need? Well, they need time. It does take a lot of time and the new technologies are always more challenging than we expect them to be. They're always supposed to take teachers away from the drudgery of teaching and give them more time actually with their students, but they never seem to end up that way. It's always more complicated. And the support to do it collaboratively, because that's the only way I can see that we reduce this massive burden of innovation that we now have. So how do digital pedagogies improve learning? Well, to answer that, I think we really have to be clear about what we mean by active and social learning. So I go back to the basic question of what it takes to learn. And then go from there to look at these five different types of learning, which, this is, sorry, just needs a few more adjustments here. Um, these five different types of learning, um, which we need to consider in turn in, through inquiry, discussion, practice, collaboration, and production. And then we can see what difference digital technologies can make. So why did I develop the conversational framework? This was intended as a way of enabling teachers to get away from the technology-driven approach to developing pedagogies. And to, to say fundamentally, what does it take to learn? Because if you ask that question, then you go to the technologies with a different frame of mind. So this was developed from the kinds of um, research on education and student learning which had been going on the entire previous century, from, uh, during, uh, throughout the 20th century, and was distilled into this very simplistic framework which nonetheless was meant to capture the essence of what we understood about what it takes to learn. And it describes learning, therefore, as a series of exchanges between the learner and the teacher, and the learner is here in the middle. Um, I have to create my pen to do that. The learner is represented here in the middle. And the exchanges are between the learner and the teacher on the one hand, and the learner and their peers on the other hand, and these two levels of concepts and practices. And this happens in any context, in any aspect of education, because after all, this was derived from studies across the whole of education. Once we've done that, then we can decide best how technology can help. So just to go through this, um, the basis of what it's trying to say is that it shows how each of six learning types as, can be defined as distinctive ways of learning and ways for the teacher to promote those recurring cycles of concept and skill development. With learning through acquisition, the teacher is always offering something to the student, developing their concepts, and something is happening. But that in itself does not make the student active. What makes them active is something like learning through inquiry. When they are devising their own idea, or they go to the library or to the teacher and ask questions or to the book or any technology 
to find out more about their understanding. So that makes the student more active and they get something back from that process. Then learning through practice presents the students with a problem or a goal to, to achieve and they have to think about their practice and drive that into the way in which they work on the learning environment. But sometimes they have to engage their conceptual understanding in order to act successfully on the learning environment. So learning through practice is more complex in that sense in the way it drives understanding and practice and the link between the two. And then learning through discussion is an exchange between a peer and, and their, uh, a learner and their peers where the learner is active in proposing questions or challenging their, their peers and the peers are challenging them back. So that can be a productive process as well. But not as productive as learning through collaboration, which is where they're focusing on practice and they're trying to make something together. So they will be sharing their practice with each other and again, the learner, the, the red arrows are meant to be the, the bits where the learner is active. They are showing what I've done with this to answer this question or to, to make this definition or to make a, an experiment or to perform a drama or whatever the, the context is. And they are seeing what their peer does and trying to come together to make a, a, productive, uh, a productive output which they both understand. So they're having to discuss as well. And in that process, they are having to debate and negotiate ideas until they come to an agreement. Discussion, you can kind of enable things to go on where you don't necessarily agree about everything. And then finally, production is where they're trying to bring all that together and produce something for the teacher, usually for an assignment or an assessment, or maybe to share with, with other people, with other students. So all of those six types of learning give us different, fundamentally different ways in which the learner is engaging with ideas and with practice, with bringing the two together, and so on. To try and enhance their learning by doing that. So we can represent quite a wide range of conventional methods on these. I mean, these will all be familiar, like doing presentations, sending students to the library, creating labs or studios or exercises, discussion groups, group projects where they have to work together, and writing a report or whatever for, for producing. So those are the familiar areas, and the conversational framework is very recognizable for, for teachers who are even working just in conventional methods. With digital methods, we have a huge array of um, all kinds of technologies which can use. This is just a tiny selection for each one. So that with um, learning through acquisition, we use digital images, animations. The internet is the most wonderful place for doing learning through inquiry. Testing a digital model or using a quiz is where the learning environment is giving you something back. Immediately you do something with it. You get something back, which is feedback, meaningful feedback. Text chat and mentee are ways of students discussing, online forums, all kinds of ways of doing that. Collaborating, well, you might put them to, to give them the task of drafting a wiki, something like that, where they have to produce something public and make it work and put their ideas into that. And then maybe a similar kind of thing for learning through production instead of the inevitable essay, get them to make a website which does the same thing so that they are being more creative in the process of evidencing their learning. So if we now look at each of those types of learning, let's just look at the different um, ways in which we can relate to them and understand what students might do. So learning um, through inquiry this is an example of, I just typed in the water cycle, which is um, uh, a concept in physics of how water flows through the earth, the air, the sea, the sky. And it's a, a commonly represented in many different ways on the internet. So it's a wonderful way for a student to see different forms of representation of the particular idea that you're looking at. I tried the same thing with communism. I got all kinds of things back. It was really interesting. Um, so we're giving students agency to discover something more about what they're learning. With learning through discussion, very typically in a class a teacher will say, are there any questions? And there'll be a, a short Q&A and one or two people will be able to ask their questions you ha and have a dialogue with the teacher. All the rest of the students can sit back and leave it to them and not really necessarily engage. But with Menti, you can invite every single student in the class to pose a question or to make a comment or to critique something which the teacher has said. And you can then look at how many of your 
your students have actually done that, but every one of them is being asked to be an active social learner. Learning through practice, this is from an example in um, uh, an engineering college where students are given a kind of computer-aided design um, project to work on and they are working interactively through that process to design what they're then going to try to make in reality. So those kinds of digital forms are a wonderful way of embodying the concept and the kind of situated learning which the students are trying to, to, to understand. And that kind of practice with meaningful feedback, I think this is another nice example from this, um, is where you interact with the model and you're trying to make it do something specific by changing the parameters. You can do the same kind of thing with a climate model, for example, or with a population model, or with um, populations within um, political science. You could experiment with what the model is saying. And what you're trying to do is to get the student to think through, how do I achieve this particular kind of result? Play with the model, and then seeing that you don't quite get that kind of result, you've got to do something more with it, sends them back to thinking through, how does this all relate together? So it should be promoting some fundamental understanding. Then learning through collaboration, well, a very simple way of doing that is to get students to share their ideas on a Padlet wall or something like that, a nice visual display. You can get them to go and critique each other's idea, whatever it happened to be, or try it out for themselves. And again, in commenting on each other's ideas in this collaborative mode, you're promoting that sort of constructivist approach that we're trying to, to yield from our students. And finally, learning through production, well, all the tools that we use as, as teachers, as presenters, are ways in which we can get students to display their understanding or to say, this is what we've learned. So this is a nice example from, uh, this was actually um, a, a grade school teacher. Um, I think this, the students were in, in grade year seven. Um, and they were being asked to uh, explain the concept of sacred buildings through producing a PowerPoint where they had to represent all the different kinds of features that sacred buildings have. So even in the context of religious education, um, bringing digital tools into this process can be enormously supportive of what the teacher is trying to do with the students. So what are the optimal ways to integrate digital technologies into teaching and learning? Well. All those are examples of um, active learning and social learning, but of course there's also learning through acquisition, learning from the teacher's presentation, and that's where the student is not actively doing their own design, but listening, reading, or watching what the teacher is doing. So we have to find ways of enabling them to be more productive there, and to use, oops, sorry, learning through acquisition as a way of really f trying to help them focus on what, what the teacher is saying. Now, one of the things that, one of the ways in which we do that, of course, is invite people to ask questions. And I'm going to do that with this audience today because I know we're not gonna have enough time to have the dialogues I would love to have with everybody. So here's a Menti site where I'm inviting you to post your comments, your questions, and your challenges so that we can continue this dialogue after the session is finished. And when I've done this previously, um, I must say I get some extremely challenging questions because you've really had time to think about it. So um, I'm relying on you to produce something that's going to be hard to answer. OK, so please post your, your challenges there. And also, then, of course, we can use those in the discussion at the end. Now, in order to deal with all these extraordinary challenges we have, um, we need to use the process of learning design because that's a way of making our pedagogic ideas very explicit. And it's different from notions of instructional design because this is taking a kind of 180 degree turn to thinking about what the teacher's doing from the learner's point of view. So it's explicitly learning design. So anything that the teacher does has to be described in this context from what the student is doing while the teacher is doing that. So I have to describe this session now as everybody paying close attention, making notes, putting down what they're going to ask for questions and so on to, to give it the best possible hope that you will actually be doing something productive. 
So what we're doing with articulating the idea of learning design, and the history of this goes, goes back to the, the 90s. Um, I think my first encounter with it was with James D.L. when he um, began to look at ways of trying to turn the description of the learning process into something like musical notation. It's a very nice idea. It's a sequence of actions and activities, and we're trying to find ways of formalizing that. Many ways of doing it, many ways of understanding a pattern, but fundamentally this basic idea is to enable us to innovate better. So it includes designing activities for learning, building on what you already know, and you know a lot from conventional teaching or from experimenting with digital already, but articulating your design in terms of what students do themselves, analyzing the design, and then optimizing the way in which we use digital methods within that design. Also then going on to evaluate those designs, and then when they're really good, and then you start sharing them. And that sharing of innovation is how we begin to tackle this huge burden of innovation that I talked about at the start. So what we did was to recognize that teachers actually get rather little help. Teachers in any sectors don't have a great deal of help. We had virtual learning environments made for us, which was very nice, but they didn't necessarily do everything we wanted to do, and they weren't designed wholly by teachers. There was a lot of other technical stuff within it. So teachers underuse virtual learning environments. But the point about devising something like the learning designer was to say, Here's your tool for thinking about what you're going to do with your students. So it's a free, open, online tool. You will get these slides, by the way. I'm, I'm hoping they will be put up on the website and these things like these links to the learning designer, which is, is up there, you'll, you'll then be able to have direct access to. And it's based on those six learning types from the conversational framework. So really, it's trying to put the conversational framework into action, derived from theory directly into action. And it supports teachers and educators to design a sequence of blended and online learning activities, so that's more or less what it looks like, and then analyze their pedagogic design through things like the pie chart, and then evaluate and reflect on how to optimize it. Now, this is not the kind of process that you would do for absolutely everything you always teach, but it is meant to be kind of a thinking tool to enable us all to reflect on why we're doing what we're doing and what this really means for the, for the student. So let me try and explain what it does. On the website, you can either adapt an existing design or browse um, through uh, what other teachers have already contributed to the, to the site, or you can start from scratch and, and create your own. If we're going to adapt one, we'd go to the browser screen, and on that tool, there is a browser screen specifically for this conference, which includes some of the learning designs which I've been talking about. And I'll select one, and the one I'm going to, to select is called um, Explaining a, con a Complex Concept in the Context of the Water Cycle. So this goes back to that water cycle idea that I mentioned. And now, if I, if I look at that, and I look through it, and I think, well, it's got the sorts of things I might be interested in doing. I'm thinking about a different kind of complex concept. I might be working in business or something, and I'm trying to get students to think about financial transactions or something of that kind. So my concept is different, but the pedagogy can still be the same. And reading through that, reading through um, the kinds of uh, how long it takes, this is just over three hours, there's a description of the kinds of students. It's online, and it's got these aims and objectives. Now, if I click on edit here, then I get an editable version. That's now my version of design. I can do what I like with it. I can change all of these things. And so to show you a bit more clearly how it works, I've expanded those two central um, parts of the process. So this is the first learning act, teaching learning activity they come to, which is about preparing your account of the system, in this case, the water cycle, and then collaborating to produce an agreed account. And each of these is made up of three different types of learning. So they're beginning by preparing their own animation to describe the water cycle. So they they've, they've had some teaching on it already. So they're, they're trying to, to find a way to um, create their own animation using their own PowerPoint. 
software. And this is assigned 20 minutes, so this is the timing icon. It's in a group of one, it's an individual task. The teacher is not present, um, and they're not using the internet for this, so there is no uh, calendar tick because they're not coming together with anybody, and there is one resource being used. And you add further resources by clicking on the plus sign. So these icons represent our description of the pedagogical features. In the next one, they choose from the six learning activities on offer, they choose the investigate or inquiry one, where they're asked to use it now, to, to use a, a video to check that they've done a good description. So they're going to another resource to check their description and improve it. And in the produce activity, they're then going back to refine what they've done. So this lasts for 10 minutes. Again, it's one individual and nobody else is involved. But the second activity, teaching learning activity is a bit more elaborate because now they're coming together in groups of three, <clears throat> first for 20 minutes and then discussing what they're doing for 20 minutes and then working together to produce, in this case, a screencast. some trouble in my voice because I think I'm not used to air conditioning. We don't need it. You know, it's different for us. So <clears throat> in, the, in, in the final stages then, they've used the video, um, their, their screencast, to represent what they've come together to understand. Now, as the program is counting up these minutes and different types of learning, we can now go to the um, analysis screen, which is at the top left of the screen, that's going back to the timeline, that's doing the analysis. We're now on the analysis screen, which is showing us this pie chart, which has counted up the total time in that whole learning session that they're doing each of these different kinds of learning. So this is a lot of learning through production, as we've seen, certain amount of learning through acquisition, uh, through collaboration, through discussion, through inquiry, and through practice. Now, there's no rules. This is very important. There's no rules about this. We can't say it should be you know, much more uh, learning through acquisition. It depends very much on the particular situation, on the context the teacher is designing for. <clears throat> and also checking against these other features, the proportion of online or um, not online, just face-to-face -face or not using anything digital, whether the teacher is present or not, and a teacher can be not present in a class situation, just leaving the students to get on with it, and they can be highly present in an online asynchronous session where they come in to do asynchronous chat with the students. So that can be um, done in a variety of different ways. And the session is either synchronous or asynchronous, and so that has different proportions as well. It also calculates how much of this was the whole class, how much was a small group, and how much was individual learning. So we just have to look at that now and think, is that what I meant to do? Is that a reasonable representation? And then go back to the timeline in order to do something different if I decide that I need to change it. But one important way to optimize the learning design is to make sure that we're embedding the most useful digital tools. So as I said, that plus sign was where you can add um, digital tools or description of it or a link to it. Um, so it's not actually embedded in the learning design itself. What's embedded is the link to the digital tool. So for this learning design, this is about a session on learning how to design a digital poster. So that could become a pretty generic kind of design uh, type session. The teacher here has used three different tools. In this case, oops, sorry. Lost it, go away. That's it. In this case, for the um, the session where they're they're working together, they're using a Google Doc to share their ideas. In the collaborate session, they're using a Miro board, uh, so their group has a Miro board, and they can play around with ideas on the Miro board and come to their understanding of what they want to do there. And then the produce activity. <coughs> They're using group forums on um, Moodle to talk to each other and finalize their design. Okay, so 
Then you can use your learning design also for that evaluate stage that I mentioned. This is another important part because we want to be able to make sure we're evaluating either with our students or with colleagues. And either way, it's possible to use this um, notes part, and I'll expand that, to show how I've asked students to, or this teacher has asked students to comment on the kind of learning design they've just been working through. Now, they're in a good frame of mind to give you quite a decent critique on this. So this one is saying, I love the investigate activity, but spent much more than 10 minutes on it. Only one person turned up to, to collaborate, but that was okay. And on the other part, the discuss part was too hurried, trying to keep them to time. We didn't get to discuss some of the issues that came up in the final session. We could have sh shared answers on Menti like we did before. So that's much more meaningful feedback than we ever get by asking people to si sign up to look at scales and things of that kind, which is what we standardly find, at least I find, on what we're, we're doing at UCL for some of our students using Moodle. They get little more than that sort of thing. But those kinds of detailed students' comments on each part of the pedagogy as you saw it, as you were designing it, can be extremely valuable for improving further performances. So to summarize this bit on supporting teachers innovating, designing activities for learning helps us focus on what students need to do. Building on what you know, you can use and adapt um, conventional methods. So you can take a perfectly conventional learning design and adapt that into digital or vice versa. Articulating what your design, your design of what students do is clarifying what and how students will be learning from every single part of that process. Analyzing the design, the kinds of feedback that the tool can give you is feedback that helps you analyze and then improve your design. Optimizing the digital tools for learning, experimenting with the different ones in the different parts of the learning process, and then getting detailed feedback either from students or from your peers. If you're working in a teaching team or you're working with other teachers or even cross-departmental, working on the same fundamental design but in completely different um, di uh, disciplinary context, that would be quite um, uh, valuable as well. Okay, so the learning designer then is there to help us collaborate, to innovate, and it helps teachers think through these pedagogies for their conventional digital and online learning, and then use the tool to share their designs with their colleagues. But if we're serious about creating this kind of innovative, collaborative community, then we've got to manage that process. It doesn't just happen just because you've got a tool that will support it. It only happens if you orchestrate that process. So we've done that by relying on MOOC platforms. Now, MOOC platforms are well designed for professional education and professional learning, not so well designed for individual students, um, undergraduates, because it's very difficult, and um, they're massive, right? So you can't do individual nurturing and support that you do um, in a normal university classroom. But for teachers, they're already experts in their field. They've got a lot to offer each other. So the kind of peer conversations we can generate on a MOOC platform are extremely valuable for that, that kind of group. So one kind of course that we ran, we, we, we did this during the pandemic, where it was created entirely online, entirely voluntary case studies contributed by teachers and that sort of thing. And we've had over that first year, we had some 12,000 or more teachers actively participating in that process. And I want to take you through the process being how we organize teachers to collaborate with each other. So in week one, it's building on their current teaching. It introduces the conversational framework and gives them some, some ideas of how they might start using that in their own practice, especially discovering um, from each other, and it's, it's taking you through what you do to move online and the new kinds of practices you can try out. And then in week two, it goes to ask them to start working with the learning designer tool to take an existing learning design and adapt it to their own field. So again, using something like the, the water cycle is quite a specific learning design built around that particular area. 
But you can make that more generic by taking out all the words about water cycle and putting in the words about your own concept, whatever the ha that happens to be. Because most of the words in those learning designs are pedagogic. They're about a pedagogic description of what students are doing. So the fact that it's about the water cycle is irrelevant. If you've got something different, if I expand this, you can see how different those concepts can be using that same basic design, or starting from that same basic design, because it can often end up very different. And you can see that the pie charts that people put up with, when they put this on, on the Padlet wall, they put their link, and so it shows what their design looked like. So some of the pie charts are quite different, but the topics are amazingly different. A digital mixing desk, how to conjugate regular and irregular verbs, child development, planet conservation, I mean, they're pretty widely different. So it's important for us to recognize that although we have this huge burden of innovation of how on earth do we best incorporate digital technology into the way that we teach, the ways we discover are not peculiar to that particular topic you happen to be doing. You can generalize across subject areas and even across education sectors. So that's um, the, the the water cycle example, which um, they're, they're starting from. So they just take all of those words and turn it into something else. And I've turned this into the list representation, which you can also get instead of the timeline representation. And you can also output your design as a Word document, so it captures all of that information you've put in, in a Word document, and it's a little easier to read. But this is just a way of showing how <clears throat> we go from the generic version, and this is, this is still written around the, the water cycle here, so this is the one you've just seen with those first three activities. And this is one that a different teacher created for understanding the key elements of financial statements. So they've got a lot which is quite the same. This is working through a water cycle video. This is watch the fin financial statements video and so on. And then this one does practice, but this one's turned that into a collaboration process and then does a practice process. And this one does the produce. This one also does the produce. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so there's a lot that's changed, but there's also a lot that's remained the same. So it's, it's like you're thinking of the learning design as a kind of starter kit. You're looking at someone else's quite detailed, well thought through pedagogy, work for them, it won't all work the same way for you, so you tweak it. But it's, um, it's, a, it's a nice way of the education world kind of emulating what we do in the context of science and scholarship, where we work, build on the work of others, we experiment ourselves, do something different, discover something, refine it, and then publish it back to that same world. Teachers should be able to do the same, but published papers and journals are not the root. That is not what will serve us well. But this kind of articulation of the fundamental pedagogy, a sort of forensic analysis of your pedagogy and how it's changing what the student is doing is very important. So those two designs came out really quite differently, even though quite a lot of the pedagogy was borrowed. So that then, in coming back to week three of this MOOC, they're then doing a kind of collaborative knowledge building there's an extract from the browser which has collected a number of, so several, several of the teachers, not all of them, but didn't have 12,000, but we had a lot of um, learning designs were then published on the learning designer itself, which is a, an option that you have. And in, again, quite a wide range of subjects. And I think this is pretty much exactly what Maytel is aiming for, and, and this is um, just culled from, from your website, to improve the connection between teaching, learning, and technology, bringing together leading experts in higher education with the goal of improving and enabling quality techno technological academic instruction. This is precisely the kind of process that we need. But I think we can involve all teachers in it. They should all be engaged in this, at least partly, either borrowing from other teachers or doing something innovative and different themselves. And I think that's what um, Skada, Malia, and Baraita are talking about when they're talking about collaborative knowledge building. They're talking about students. But this democratization of innovative capacity is what we need for the entire teaching profession now. So part of a, this process, um, how are we doing for time? I think I'll, I'll just go very quickly through this slide because this is about our theory of change. 
and just documenting the sequence of activities we go through and, and how that sets up this process of developing a collaborative MOOC of the kind that I've been describing by starting with the professionals themselves and then working through to the point where it becomes sustainable. Um, so again, this is an iterative process. So you'll have the slides so you can look at that in a bit more detail. But I'd like to get on to looking at why in particular digital technologies um, can help with some of the really big challenges we have. Looking at reducing teacher workload, because that's going to be really important, especially with the advent of ChatGPT, which is going to make assessment much more difficult for us. So we're going to really have to find ways of producing, of reducing teacher workload and improving student learning at the same time. Just looking at two particular learning designs for peer review and for what I like to call vicarious personalized learning. So the peer review, students have a lot of opportunities to work together online now and they're much more used to it. So um, if they've got the right technology, if they've got access to it, then this is a, a, a very good um, historic technique. Um, nothing new about um, peer review, but making it online, um, it runs very smoothly away from the teacher. So the teacher sets assignments and a rubric on the VLE. So each student is producing their own answer, receiving two answers from the peers, and that's just run by the system. And then they've got two reviews back, and they've done two reviews. Now that's the most important part of this whole process is doing a review. And I think you'll be aware from your own experience that when you're reviewing someone else's academic paper, it does make you think about your own and the way that you would write that kind of paper, not just critiquing theirs. So that doing a review is a very important part of the student's own review process and then they submit what by that time should be an improved draft for the teachers. And that makes the teacher's job simpler or better because they're not trying to say, look, you didn't go through the rubric, these points in the rubric. The students might already have said that to them. So the teacher has improved dra drafts, uh, assignments to grade with no additional workload, just setting the thing up on, on the VLE. Um, and if you've got uh, a tutor group where you're, you're doing quite uh, refined feedback to each of the students in the group. A, a music, um, <clears throat> musical instrument lesson would be an obvious example, but it could just as easily be a philosophy tutor group where the, the academic is feeding back a rather precise critique of the way that a student has made their argument. Now that is of value to the other students in the room as well, but it need not be just to those students. If you video that interaction, that becomes something you can put on the VLE as a kind of masterclass where all the students watching it, they don't get personal feedback, but they get feedback that they can relate to because there's other students having the same problems they have. So again, for the teacher, they're providing personal feedback for the original five students with their permission, making a video so that only the other students see it, nobody else sees it, but all the students benefit from that now forensically detailed guidance that they all had. And you'd rotate that process throughout the term, so, you, so that all the students get uh, a turn at being in that group. Now that changes the teacher workload quite dramatically from doing 10 different tutor groups, but it gets an awful lot of value about, out of the one that they do. So things like this, it's worth experimenting with to both see ways in which we can reduce teacher workload and improve student learning at the same time. We're really going to need these things. So again, the point is from this generic learning design for a peer review that with the learning design of browser, you could adapt, uh, adopt and adapt quite a range of different kinds of um, learning ideas, learning lesson, lesson, learning design ideas from other teachers. So to summarize, Teachers as collaborative designers of learning, there are many advantages of learning with digital technology, which you'll be extremely aware of, in all these contexts of creating more active learning, more meaningful feedback to the student, peer learning, reducing teacher workload, all of those things can be affected in different ways. How do we help students learn? Well, we focus fully on what the student is doing in learning with activities aimed at specific outcomes and involving all the, that range of learning types. 
a learning designer tool. There's nothing quite like the one that I've, I've um, mentioned to you, but there are other kinds of learning design tools as well, of course. And the point is to enable the teachers to innovate, to optimize that blend, articulate your pedagogy in more detail than usual, and then share it to collaborate and get better ideas from other teachers than you would normally have. They can collaborate to innovate using MOOC platforms and something like the Learning Designer, which has about 1,000 people using it every day at the moment. Um, managing teacher workload becomes feasible because the digital technologies and collaborative learning translate to collaborative learning among teachers as well. So finally, teachers as collaborative designers of digital pedagogies, who will develop these new digital pedagogies? Trust the teachers. We have to trust the teachers. They are part of this now, and they should be in every single phase of learning design that all of those ed tech companies are trying to do. We need their wisdom and understanding and experience. What do students need? More active and social learning. What do teachers need? Support and time. And I just want to flag up, we've got a new book coming out soon, it's called Online Learning Futures, where you can read more. And I really look forward to our discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Diana.